So I'm going to talk about online privacy, security, and password management. Uh, first of all, uh, I am not a lawyer. Keep that in mind, right? <laughs> and more importantly and specifically, I'm not your lawyer. If you need legal reviews for any ideas from this talk tonight, talk to your lawyer. Don't, don't get legal stuff from me. Go talk to your own lawyer, pay your own person, and get that for, for legal information. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to do illegal things that I know of. Uh, however, a couple things I do, I'm going to recommend are not necessarily what businesses want you doing. Too bad. All right. So these are a list of different companies uh, that have broken into. Uh, you notice that, uh, oops, I, might, I didn't get the fonts on here. Uh, so uh, for Yahoo and LinkedIn have been broken in multiple times. Uh, LinkedIn has gotten better about their password management over the years, but they, it took three break-ins for them to do things they should have been doing from the first day the company existed. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a sad state. Uh, and then, of course, they got bought by a company that has even worse password management. So uh, it's not a good sign. Uh, also, some of the different individuals that have been broken into. Um, we'll talk about Matt Honan. He's going to show up a couple times during the presentation. Um, and uh, the, they've had negative repercussions because of their accounts being broken into. Uh, so with Heartbleed, the first one that's up there, back at the time that it happened, you could presume that pretty well every site was compromised from Heartbleed unless it had credible notice that it hadn't been because it just hit everything, right? Um, and Heartbleed gave access to all data that was in memory, uh, which meant if you'd logged in recently, they had all your data. So you could presume as of two years ago, essentially yeah, two years ago at this point, every, every uh, website out there had been broken into. And we can see that they've con continued getting broken into. Uh, this is hardly go back and read it on your own uh, sometime, but Randall does a good job of uh, creating a succinct and humorous description of the problem, what happened with Heartbleed and why that was an issue for us. That was two years ago, but it's an indication of what could come out tomorrow, right? So we found that one. That one's been fixed, but that was an open SSL, which has had many other security releases since then. Uh, and there are lots of other tools that are basic to how the internet works uh, that could, uh, could it, we could find a security bug in next week, or maybe certain agencies have already found those bugs and been taking advantage of them. So the key, key comes down to that we don't know what the cloud computing does, is, companies are doing, and we can't trust that they can keep things safe. And even the companies that do a good job, we can't trust that they can keep it safe. That's just the nature of how digital uh, uh, um, information works. So we need to do what we can on our side to keep things safe uh, and to make sure that compromises in one place don't affect other places. So I mentioned Matt Honan. Uh, he is a Wired uh, uh, magazine um, uh, reporter, or was at the time. Uh, but a few years ago, somebody broke into his accounts, uh, and they deleted all of the data off of his laptop, off of his phone. Um, and uh, they could have, they had access, full access to his Apple accounts, to his Google accounts, to his Amazon accounts. So they could have used that to then go after all of his banking information, they, which they didn't do, to go after all of his friends, to go after everybody he knew uh, with the access that they had. Um, and the sad thing is they did it because he had a short Twitter handle. And they just thought it would be fun to, to take over a short Twitter handle and use it to post some racist stuff. Uh, so they, did, they broke into him just for that and destroyed a bunch of his data. This is uh, what was at stake for him. He lost all the pictures of his daughter at that time. He lost a bunch of pictures of family, including people who had passed away, and did not know whether or not he'd be able to get any of that data back. As it turns out, he did uh, through some circumstances, but he was, he was able to get it back. But at the time, he just saw all of that was gone. Uh, all of his copies of it were gone. Um, he uh, uh, also got quick response from the cloud providers, from Google and Apple and, and other companies, uh, but he was a reporter for Wired. So he got broken into, wrote an article about it, and suddenly everybody was contacting him instead of him ha contacting everybody. He, still, he says he still had to go through normal channels in order to get his data taken care of, but he got expedited and closer review than most of us would get. Actually, then all of us would get pretty well. All right. Uh, so first things first, 
install security updates. Do that all the time. Uh, better if you can install just security updates. Depends on your distribution, about how easy it is. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, hey, there's a new, there's new documentation for, for OpenOffice. Uh, it's not a security problem, right? If there's a security problem with, with LibreOffice, I want the new version of LibreOffice. But if it's just going through and correcting documentation or correcting you know, the translation or something or whatever, I, I don't care, right? What I want are the security updates. You want to get those all the time. Automate that if you can. That's something you can do to keep your own systems in, 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 uh, more secure. Um, so uh, for all right, oh, we're going to skip that. All right, so we're going to do a little demo about what encryption is and what that, what that means. So we talk about encryption. You need encryption. We need to have encrypted websites. But we don't talk about what it really means, what it is that you're doing uh, with, with encryption. So if you think about sending email, if you send email without encryption, you're basically sending a postcard. So I've got a fake postcard here, I've got a piece of paper with information on it. Brian's getting good pictures of it. I don't know how, you know, resolution, whether or not you can zoom in and read that. But as that goes through the system, there's lots of people who have access to go through and read it. If you're using a mail provider, system means at that company. If you're sending it to somebody with a mail provider, system means at that company. Uh, and if it's not encrypted along the way, every router in between those two providers. Uh, and if you, even if you're sending from Gmail to Gmail, there's, there's transactions going in place. A lot of people have access to that. Um, and unlike uh, uh, um, physical mail, I don't need to physically get a hold of it. I can just make copies of the bits as they go through the stream. So encryption is taking that and basically putting it inside an envelope before you send it and making sure that that data is enclosed. And now, when you, if, you, if you've encrypted it, the receiver can open it back up, but it can't be read, or the, the data itself can't be read in, in uh, in midstream. They have a copy of the envelope, and they have a copy that there was data inside of it, but the encryption is basically locking them out. Now, if they have bad encryption, it can be broken pretty easy. But let's presume that, that, that we're getting better at doing encryption. Uh, if we're not, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, but we're trying. So that has, that's how it works with email. But for reviewing a website, if you pull up a website and you do HTTP, then that is not encrypted and secure. If you use HTTPS, and they have certificates and everything done correctly, then it's encrypted. Well, what does that mean for HTTP? Because you're not just sending an email. Yeah, you're sending a web page, but a web page has thousands of things in it. You might be looking at a stream, or it might be a phone call, or whatever else like that. So you can think of that as being an open road, where you can see the car driving wrong, and they can see, again, what data you have. Or you can think of it as a tunnel, where whatever data you're putting in, is blocked from view as it's traveling from point A to point B, as the server is sending it to you. Uh, when we have other people closer, I, I sometimes put chocolate in, and you can't tell which one they're getting. All right. So that's kind of the difference between encrypted and unencrypted. Unencrypted means anybody along the way can see it, and there are lots of people along the way. Even when you're sending, just sending email, there's lots of people who have opportunity to see that as that, that data transfers. It makes sense. If you're sending email from here to Hong Kong, it's not one person, right? You, it's not one carrier. If you were sending it a letter, it, your postal person isn't picking it up and then delivering it next door. It takes, there's a lot of steps to get from here to there. And all of those steps allow opportunity for observing uh, your, your content. All right, so when to use encryption? All the time. <laughs> use it for everything. Uh, use it every time. Uh, there is a... Uh, uh, add-in for uh, Mozilla Firefox called HTTPS Everywhere from the EFF. Um, recommend using that. That will get your browser to default to a secure connection when a secure connection is available and is the same content. So most providers nowadays are doing that. Your, H your secure connection and your non-secure connection are the same content. So that keeps track of that and will keep you from getting to a non-encrypted uh, version when that is possible. Uh, it is now available from the add-in it's not a store. I don't know what, what Firefox calls it or Mozilla calls it, but from their normal add-in. So you can go to tools, add-ons, and grab HTTPS everywhere. So I recommend installing that and using that everywhere. Uh, like the, the, the postcard example that says, keep everything encrypted when we're, we're talking to the web servers. 
Uh, now, what else to encrypt? Uh, so these are pieces of data that are really important to make sure they're encrypted. So logging in your credentials, right? You don't want somebody else reading your password. Uh, when you're submitting personal information, and that includes your name, your address, your phone number. Uh, by law, I don't think they count your, your address, even when associated with your name, as being confidential. But I consider those to be confidential. Uh, for anybody that's ever been stalked, they consider it to be confidential. Uh, for in, you know, anybody that, that's any kind of risk or, or something, that is definitely confidential information. If you're concerned about anybody on the planet knowing it, then go through and, and, and ensure that it's encrypted when you're using it. Uh, so your phone number, credit card information, social security number, uh, any kind of private photos that you don't want shared. Uh, regardless of whether or not they're embarrassing, you just might not want to share them. Uh, that was one of the things that came out with uh, Nat Honan's article. He talked about he had pictures, and he does a lot of things online, so many of his pictures were available just because he'd published them different places. Um, but a lot of the more important pictures weren't because he kept those. Those were private. When his daughter was first born, those were things for him and his wife to share, not for the, the rest of the world. Um, but he'd lost those when the hackers went through and took them out. Or if you, you know, live in Oklahoma, you're used to your, all of your uh, 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 computers being sent across the state once a year through uh, tornadoes and so forth. So you want to make sure you've got you know, uh, um, backups. And you want to make sure that those are, are secure when they, when they do get airmailed that way. All right. Uh, so the other thing is password bleed over. So if you use the same password at multiple sites, then if somebody breaks into that site, LinkedIn's been broken into three times. So if you're using the same password for LinkedIn that you're using for a lot of other sites, then the, the, the people that broke into to, to LinkedIn and anybody they gave the data to can then use that to check your other sites. If you happen to use the same credentials for your bank, they now have access to your bank. If you gave the same credentials for some kind of actual social networking as opposed to LinkedIn, then they have access to your social networking as well. So if you're using the same information multiple places, if it's stolen once, it can be used everywhere, right? Just like your house key. If you use the house key to open your house, to open your garage, to open your car, to open your business, and somebody steals your keys, they now have access to everything, right? So you want to use a different key for each different uh, 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 service. Um, the, I call this, when, they, when, when the set of credentials can be used in multiple places, the domino effect, in that they can then immediately roll over everything else. And as far as the timing it takes, it's, it's milliseconds. So they have your credentials. It takes them milliseconds to check all the banks you've ever heard of to see if your credentials work at a bank. So it, they, have, they, they have access to it before you or anybody else knows that your, your information was stolen. Uh, in fact, that might be the way you find out your information was stolen because all of your money was as well. All right. Uh, or emails, as, as the case may be for some people. So use unique passwords for every site. Different passwords, period, for every, every site that you log into. And any place else that you would be providing credentials. All right. Now, these are also things that you could worry about. So username is also to, to use to identify who you are, your email address, your password, security questions, uh, pins that you use for uh, uh, different devices. Uh, including on websites, uh, and multi-factor authentication. All of those provide a way for you to prove that you are you, or for somebody else to prove that they are you, if they get a copy of those. So make sure it's unique, so that they, even if they do get a copy, they can't use it at other sites. Uh, now, unique uh, means that each, not just that the, e, the uh, password should be different, but the email address and the username should be different as well if you can do that. So a lot of places allow you to choose your email or your, your username. Choose a random uh, 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 username as well. And that way both pieces are different and it makes it more difficult for them to even identify who you are at another site. And we'll talk about email addresses and how to keep those different as well. All right, so I mentioned random. And uh, I think I said random string. I want to talk about what a random string is because I'm going to probably use that term a bunch. So it's a string of or a sequence of random gibberish, just different letters. Uh, you know, pound your hand, your your fist on a keyboard, you get a random string, right? Not as random as you might think because you're going to still hit keys in different ways. But you know, for those of us that aren't doing you know PhDs in mathematics, it's it's fairly random. 
Um, the, uh, the longer and more random a string is, is better. So 20 letters is better than 12 letters. 60 letters is even better than that. Uh, and then you also want to make it as random as possible uh, and use as many characters as you can. So not just alpha, uh, the, the alphabet, but uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special characters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so punctuation I list there. I didn't list every type of punctuation. I just hit the keyboard when I did that line. Uh, underline and dash, those do need to be treated a little bit differently because some places just don't take them. Actually, some of the, the, the other stuff I'll get to in a second, sir. Um, so be careful using the underline and dash. I found a lot of places just have problems with them. Uh, the other thing is, depending on your font, you can't tell the difference between them. And we'll, we'll get to that in a, a second somewhere else. Uh, and then spaces. Again, you might or might not be able to use spaces depending on uh, the site. In fact, for like usernames, often spaces aren't allowed at all. Uh, and then I gave an example of a random string I, used, uh, I created using a, a tool called APG. Yes, sir. So, so Amex will not allow you to use any special characters whatsoever in your password. Somebody tried to tell me that there was an actual explanation for that, that there was a way that you could hack if you could put characters in, it would drop you down to a, a command prompt. That doesn't make any sense to me. Back in the 80s and 90s, there were problems with Unix logins and other logins, but I know specifically Unix, where some special characters were handled differently, so the at symbol was handled differently. But that was at a, a system, not on a website. Um, so yeah, it's, it's foolish to do that nowadays. I can see somebody saying we're going to stick with what's in ASCII, because once you start doing Unicode, there's a whole bunch of other things in there. And I just don't know Unicode well enough to understand if it's safe or not. Um, I know it can be unsafe. I, I'm, I am certain of that. Um, but anything that's in the normal ASCII al alphabet, slash, backslash, parentheses, even quotes, should all be handled properly um, by coders who are better than I am. There's a reason I don't code the authentication systems. Um, but that should all be done. Uh, Amex, I don't get it. You, they're, they're a financial institution. You'd think that they would take security seriously. But not allowing special characters, basically limiting you to alphanumeric, uh, is not taking uh, uh, security seriously as far as I'm concerned. Um, but uh, I'm not in charge of there. They may be trying to eliminate SQL injection. They might be, but the better way to eliminate SQL injection is just to fix their systems. They can right. you have as many systems as they do, at which point the odds of fixing all of them are low. Yeah, but changing what you can do on passwords isn't, isn't fixing the problem either. So anyway, um, but yeah, uh, it's, I worked at a startup in the financial industry uh, a number of years ago, and I was flat out amazed at how poor uh, security was uh, in a lot of the systems that we rely on today for credit stuff. And things have gotten better, and I know people, we, many of us know people who are doing better, uh, at least for portions of those financial institutions. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing sometimes. All right, now, oops. So I, there's a lot of data here, random strings. If, I'm, if, if you're going to memorize or have 60 character random strings for every website you go to, most of us can't memorize that. It's theoretically possible, but I don't want to live in a monastery where I just spend my day memorizing passwords, right? <laughs> Especially since you're supposed to change them every once in a while, so you know, you've you got to go through and do it again. So. What do you do when your brain's full? You can't, you can't keep track of all this stuff, or it doesn't seem realistic. Uh, that's where password managers come in put into to account. They will help us be that external brain, storing that information for us so that we can use it. That, but that gives us the ability to do even more things, which we'll start talking about. Uh, and by the way, I, I presume that all of us have hundreds of accounts at this point, right? You've got for your banks, for your social media, for your email, stuff for work for random places that you've bought things, uh, but you don't want somebody else using your credit card information that they gathered and sending things off to some other country. Um, so you've got passwords all these, all these different places. Um, you've got to have some, some place to store it because you can't, like I say, theoretically, we just can't keep track of all that on our own. So password managers are the tools that I, rec the tool that I recommend to use for that. Um, there are other ways of doing things. Roll your own with GPG, but I'll use password managers. Part of it is because it's a built tool that's got audits. Other people have looked at it. 
uh, other people are using it, and they also add some tools that you wouldn't normally get unless if you're rolling your own. Um, so they will securely support, s store your credential information, uh, and they are usually pretty easy to use for authentication. Uh, definitely things there, there uh, will help. Now here's a, a list of requirements that I have and that I recommend for password managers. First, it needs to be free software. If the code has not been audited, if it can't be audited by just random people, then we shouldn't count it as secure. Uh, that is shown to be the case time after time after time. And so we need that, you need anything to do with security, uh, especially something that you're using personally, you really want that to be free software that people can look at and make sure that one, they're using good algorithms, and two, that they're implementing them correctly. Uh, we have lots of cases. Uh, go to food with us afterwards and we can start talking about lots of cases where that was not the case. And when people got the chance to look at the code, they easily found problems with, with something. Um, and also it's, it's important from our perspective as the people using it that the code can be forked. So if the person that is, is taking care of it turns out to be, uh, have problems, whether they just disappear or whatever else, you've got a copy of the code. Other people have a copy of code. They can take that and continue on the project. Um, and that is important because you don't want to suddenly no longer have access to all your passwords, right? Um, so it's important that the, that the, the project can continue, continue on and not be dependent on one person. A fork is the best way to make sure you have that because if the person becomes unresponsive, move on and, 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 and uh, keep, it, uh, keep the project alive. Um, you want an open, somewhat common format. The reason for that is because you need to be able to go from operating system to operating system depending on what your use case is. But also if the operating system you're using becomes uh, unsustainable for some reason, you want to be able to still be to get copies of your data. Um, and of course, nowadays we need to be able to use a computer and a mobile device. So you want something that will work on both of those. Um, by having an open format, you also get to where you have multiple tools that can use the same format. And we'll talk about that when I get up here, get up here a little bit. Uh, hidden passwords, so th that's basically shows stars and save your password so people can't look over your shoulder and find it, it what it is or take screenshots, things like that. Uh, the reason I didn't use a, a password manager for many years was because I did not know that they did automatic clipboard clearing. So they go through and clear the clipboard after uh, the, one, the tool I recommend after 10 seconds so that when you've copied your password into the clipboard and pasted it into the web browser, 10 seconds later it's removed from the, from the clipboard so if somebody can break into your clipboard the next day, they can't get to it. And so you don't have to worry about accidentally pasting it into IRC 10 minutes later um, because it's, it's no longer there to be pasted. Um, data liberation is about getting your data back out. So just because you can get into the tool today, especially with cloud services, doesn't mean you can get into it tomorrow. So you want to make sure you've got a way of getting the data back out of that tool into something else. Having an open format kind of takes care of that because you have multiple tools that can talk to the format. Uh, easy copy and paste is useful. Uh, password generator, I put as a requirement because most people just want to use one tool, but you could use a password generator somewhere else and copy into the, the, the uh, um, password manager if you need to. Um, and you need notes because you'll end up needing to be able to do things like the question about uh, uh, Amex not allowing special characters. Well, then you can put that in the entry so you remember not to try to use a percent the next time you change your password with them. Uh, and then just for use usability, we need to be able to organize so I can say my banking stuff, my non-banking stuff, whatever else. Now, these are things that I think would be awesome if password managers have. Uh, and the first one, uh, the, the tool I recommend no longer has, it used to have, is human readable password generation. And this is important because at some point, you're going to have a security question that you have to read to somebody on the phone. And if you just have something that has a bunch of X's and Q's and K's in it, you can't pronounce that. Well, if you're Finnish or Hawaiian, maybe. But the rest of us can't pronounce that. So having something that is somewhat pronounceable and yet still fairly random is good. Uh, the other thing is uh, if it can come with a pronunciation guide that actually helps you, you know, hey, this now sounds like Klingon, but I've got like the Latin translation and I can still say it, right? Uh, and then this, the, the, this is the holy grail for me. Random string generation from anywhere within the, the, the uh, application. I don't know of a tool that does this at this point. Uh, you go in and create an account and it locks down 
uh, or you know, uh, um, different pieces. I can't get to the random generator because I want to have random strings everywhere, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, secondary key value storage. So the security questions. I want to be able to keep the security questions and answers in the same entry. Uh, so that that it's important to have that. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, and then, of course, copy and paste of those entries so I don't have to go through and do a whole bunch of things in order to copy stuff out. Uh, and then, again, this is something the tool I recommend doesn't have, unfortunately, is data export with a sync. So I can't say, take these things that I want on my phone, but only these like five entries or these 50 entries that I want on my phone and export it to another file. I can actually do that, but then I can't keep that file in sync. So I have to just export randomly every time again. Uh, and I'm, exp I'm trying to play with tags and figure out a way to do it more efficiently. Um, but right now, I basically have to sync by copying and pasting from one file to another file. All right. So my recommendations that I've been ar already been talking about, KeePassX, we're, we're a Linux user group. So I'm going to go with the one that is free software and built for Linux. Uh, and uh, in the case of KeePass, doesn't use Mono, because I, I don't like or trust Mono. So KeePassX is a great tool. Uh, 2.x came out, so 2.0 came out, I think, uh, at the beginning of the last year or something like that. Um, it's still missing a few features from KeePass, uh, the 1x series, but overall I find it to be usable, and the extra features it has make it worthwhile. Uh, it just might mean that you occasionally have to reach for another tool for password uh, uh, generation and a couple things like that. Uh, I use KeePass Droid on the, on the Android devices. Um, and I find that it's a, a nice, inter, uh, nice interface, nice tool for mobile uh, uh, environments. Uh, and then KPCLI is a command line interface to KeePass. Uh, I don't think it's quite as secure as KeePass X is because the way it has to do some things on the command line. Um, but overall, it's nice. And it's good when you're like, oh, I don't remember that. And it's only on my system at home. I can SSH in, use KPCLI to get to it, and then close back out and move on. Uh, KPCLI is also the tool I'm looking at for being able to do the tagged exports and stuff, because it's got a couple of features in there. Uh, and it's also Perl, so I can add features if I really, really need to. Uh, and then KeePass is the original tool uh, that was uh, KeePassX uses the KeePass file format. Actually, all of these tools use the KeePass file format. Um, and uh, it was originally made for Windows. It is free software, but it's for Windows, so I don't care. Um, because it's free software, people have gotten compiled, and it works under Linux and Mac. Um, but under Linux, I'd rather use KeePassX. Uh, and as say, specific for me, I don't like mono, so that allows me to avoid no mono. Yes. One of the nice things with all these different versions mm -hmm. is that they do keep themselves synchronized. They can be set up to do that. Keep, you mean, what do you mean they keep themselves synchronized? <laughs> if you add a password yeah. on KeePass Droid, it will synchronize back to KeePassX on your desktop. Depending on how you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. gets it. Uh, the other thing is, though, I also I mentioned having an open format that multiple tools can access. There are four tools that can access this particular file format right there. Uh, and there are lots of other tools that can as well, but just from the basic KeePass brand, you know, uh, family, we already have four tools that can open, open those files. Uh, and uh, uh, with KeePass X, it now has support for the version, uh, the KeePass 2X file format. Uh, and you'll, you'll need to move to that as well, which, which is better than the old format as well. All right, so one password to hold them all. So you end up with one password that you do need to memorize, <laughs> the, the password for your key pass file. Um, that is something you'll need to make sure you, re you remember, because if you lose that, you lose all the data that's in there. If you can't remember that, you can't get in. Now, instead of memorizing it, you can put in a post-it note on your computer. That would be fabulous, right? Put it on a, you know, tattoo it somewhere or something like that. That's, that that'd be a great idea as well. Um, so I would suggest memorizing it. Uh, we'll talk in a second about how to make it m more easily memor memorable uh, passwords. Um, and also, when you do this, use it several times. So before you start putting data in there that you don't have copies of anywhere else, open up, create a new uh, 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 key, uh, password database, put the password in, Close, open up, authenticate again, close, authenticate again. You know, start getting that thing into muscle memory. Next morning when you wake up, first thing, log in. You know, make sure you remember that password. Uh, because again, if you lose it, you lose access to everything. 
All right? And you can start doing like a key pass file that has the password for your other key pass file, that has a password for your other key pass file, and try to do some circular thing as well. But it's best to make sure you memorize these really well. All right, so for memorizing, again, XKCD. Um, this is a great example of how to make a somewhat easy to remember uh, passphrase that is long. Th this helps uh, 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 quite a bit. Uh, um, and uh, is something that you can remember, but is not easily guessable. Because the key is that the four words that he's re as he's recommending it can't be things that pass together. It's not the lyrics from your favorite song. It's not the you know four of the the seven dwarves. It's not your kids or your dogs or you know your favorite tomato brand, types of tomatoes. Whatever, right? You want to make them random if you can. If you know multiple languages, choose words in different languages. If you can. Put punctuation in there instead of just spaces. So semicolons and colons and so forth. Uh, really cool thing about key pass. Actually, if you needed to type, go through and take your, your key pass password and put it in another key pass database, one of the things that key pass X will allow you to do is, is all kinds of things. So you can actually copy and paste snippets of code into your passphrase for key pass and use that. So maybe if you're, if you're a kernel developer, you just pull something out of a standard library for your, your emergency backup access to your password or something like that. So you can be fairly creative with this. Be as creative as you can. Make it as long as you can for practically being able to remember and being able to type. Because if you make it hard to type, you're also going to make it hard to use. All right. So, all right. So this is blurry here. I don't know. Hopefully it's not blurry for you guys. So this is the, uh, the, the new interface. Uh, for uh, creating a new entry. Um, now, one of the things here, it shows the password. Uh, you'll see down below where the password is. You can click to turn on uppercase, lowercase, uh, punctuation, uh, numbers. Um, I'll get to KeyPass 1 in a second. KeyPass 1 had a much better interface for create, generating a, a uh, random string. Um, but this is still fairly sufficient. And you can always use an external tool and copy and paste into uh, keypass X. So you could use keypass 1 to generate passwords for keypass 2, uh, keypass X2. Um, other features in here is it gives you a chance to expire. So if you work at a place that requires you to change your password every three months, you can get the keypass to remind you. Or if you want to remember to change your password every three months, you can get keypass to remind you. Um, and uh, you also can put in the URL. So you, you, you can, instead of clicking in the email that says, hey, you must change your password. Don't click on that. If you want to check and make sure your bank really wants you to change your password, go to your, your password manager, pull the URL from there, or type it in by hand, whichever, and, go, and, and do it that way. And that way you know you're not being uh, uh, caught by a, a uh, link typo or something like that. Fish. Fish. You're not being fished. All right. Uh, yeah, fish food is a type of ice cream. It's not a way to take, handle your email. All right. Uh, so this is the KeyPass X uh, one interface for password generator. Uh, there's a couple of really cool features on here. Again, they've got checkboxes for uppercase, lowercase, and, and so forth. Uh, they also have uh, special characters in here. Uh, the middle piece in the tabs at the top is pronounceable, so you can already get in and, and let KeyPass give you a password that's, that, that's fairly pronounceable. They don't give you a pronunciation guide. So if you need a pronunciation guide, I recommend APG, which is a command line tool, automatic password generator, and you can tell it to say, give me a, a pronunciable password uh, um, and give me a pronunciation guide for that as well. And then the third tab at the top is custom. So if, you're, if Amex finally says, oh, OK, we'll start letting you use special characters, you can use dot and colon, you know, period and a colon. That's special characters, right? Well, you can then say, OK, I'll, I'll use those as my my punctuation. So under custom, you can say, for special characters, just use those or use some subset. Um, or if you just you know, find it hard to, do, to, to type semicolons, because that should be the end of a line of code, uh, you can say, don't, don't use those, right? All right, so pronounceable strings. I've mentioned them a couple times. So like I said, they're, they're things that, that are random, but you can still pronounce them. Uh, so they're kind of like Dr. Seuss words, you know, just make stuff up. Uh, and uh, you know a little bit less rhyme and a little bit less easy to, to, to say, um, but still as, as, uh, uh, um, we want as much randomness as we can. When you use pronounceable strings or things that you might have to spell out to somebody letter by letter 
or you might have to type. You want to avoid characters that look the same. So the number one and the lowercase l, depending on the font you're using, look the same, uh, especially if your eyes aren't working as well as they used to. And zero and O just look the same <laughs> under most fonts. Unless you have a font that puts a slash to the O, telling the difference is you, know, you type one and, and check and see if it's the same width. You know? um, so we want to avoid those under some circumstances. Um, again, you want a pronunciation guide. I've mentioned that a couple times. And the next example, the next line is an example of a pronounceable, uh, uh, a pronounceable uh, uh, passphrase with a pronunciation guide next to it. Uh, and as I say, it's useful over the phone, any place where you might have to, to read, read aloud to somebody what it is that you've, you've used. Um, so ID, how do you identify yourself? Uh, password, we've already talked about that a couple times. Username, email address. So some places don't allow you have, to have a username. They, they require you use your email address as your username. Uh, cookies, uh, device ID. We'll talk about that in a second, what that is and why that matters. Security questions and answers. Companies are using those to, to as secondary or in the case of a lost password or somebody trying to break into your account, security questions and answers come into to account. Multi-factor authentication and birth date. You know, that's again something that's in there. Social security number, other things that are used as identifying information. So for the username, for banks and shopping utilities and stuff, use a random string, right? So, so for social media, you don't want to tell people to look for Google, Google, Google on the social media account, right? You want, to, you want something that people will recognize, presuming you're wanting them to find you. If you want anti-social media, use a random string, right? That's great. They'll be able to find out who you are. Uh, well, some people will. But anyway, uh, so but for banks, places where people aren't public, you're going to see your, your ID. Uh, or where you don't care what they see if, they, if it's publicly, um, go through and use that. I, you know, for different accounts that I've got, I've got uh, uh, a couple of places that I shop at that then put such and such just bought something or another, whatever, right? Or the first person to buy this. And they get a random string. So unless you've sold a surfed on me, you have no idea that that's me when I go through and buy something from them. Because they don't need to be telling people what I bought. Right? It's none of, none of somebody else's business. Um, so use a random string when you can. For all of my utilities and banks and stuff like that, I've just got random gibberish. The only problem I run into that is use a shorter string, because one, you might have to type it or say it to somebody. Uh, the other thing is, you, by using a shorter string, it's easier to tell that's the username as to the password, because they both random junk. So you know, long, passwords will be longer, and, and usernames will be 10 or 12 characters. Uh, your email address. Now, as I say, some places are using your, your email address as the username for the site, but also they use it as a secondary piece of information of, of uh, uh, identification. So if you call in, you call in, right, with, with a strange accent, uh, and want to get access to your account over the phone, you can use your email address to prove that you're you because nobody else would know your email address, right? Um, so one of the things you can do is use sub addressing, which allows you to put a token and then a random string after that token. Now that random string can be my bank, or it can be random gibberish. Um, or it can be a combination of the both, which is what I recommend. Uh, and the key is that it gets delivered to whatever happens in front of that token. Most places, and the default is to use a plus. So Gmail, that's what they use, one of the largest email provider out there, right? Um, they use a plus. So whatever you're, if you're using a Gmail account, you can have you know, your email account plus and then stuff at gmail.com. And when they deliver it, they'll only deliver, they'll, they'll take the plus and the other stuff and ignore that for delivery. Now, if you have Gmail through a uh, educational institution or through work, they might have turned off plus addressing. So check that it works before you start using it. I would love to be able to use it for work because it would make things easier to filter because I could go say, hey, this is just random stuff I don't care about if it comes to this email address. Go away forever. Um, or go into my git commits folder and I'll look at git commits when I care about git commits. Stuff like that, right? Um, and then uh, if you use uh, the, the random token and then some kind of string that makes sense for you, that makes it easier for you to, to identify what the email addresses are for. But you can also use that for filtering your mail. Um, so the biggest example is, uh, that I use for, for that is eBay. Uh, since eBay existed, they've been sending out phishing mail for eBay. Uh, you know, I've got, I get 
you know, through plug the mailing li our mailing list, I get dozens of emails a month claiming to be for my email account coming to my e my plug list email address. I have never done eBay stuff through plug through my that, that address. So by going through and saying, okay, this is my eBay email account, anything claiming to be e for from eBay for anything other than this account is not from eBay. And I can automatically throw all those in the spam. Um, and I will give, since e eBay gets a lot of uh, 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 notoriety for this, and it's not their fault, um, it's just the, the nature of the service that they provide, um, they do a good job in that they send email from a single email account, or they did last I looked. So you can also filter an email coming in, whether or not it's from eBay, because if it's not from that email address, it's not from eBay. Um, granted, the email, that email address can be spoofed, but it's at least a, a good start. When it's eBay blah 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 .cz, uh, unless you've unless you've been uh, doing eBay in Czech Republic, you don't have to worry about that. Yes, yeah, Ed. Actually, a bunch of years ago, I think you did set something up with eBay for uh, conferences. Not with eBay. With other places, I did, but eBay, I, we didn't we didn't eBay any conference tickets that I know of because we were giving them away. But yeah. Yeah, PayPal we did. Yeah, and PayPal is is an, is similar to the to the uh, um, uh, social media sites. So social media sites, uh, you don't know what email address you might get a, a uh, an invite from. It might be a work email address, or if you're like me that has hundreds of email addresses, can be any of those. Um, PayPal, if I'm getting paid through a company or through consulting or stuff like that, that might be different email addresses. So that becomes a little bit more difficult to just use a random string, but you can, you can figure out what works for you. All right. uh, so using sub-addressing, as I say, using a unique ID for each, uh, for, in the email address for every site. Um, I already covered these parts. Uh, you filter mail. Uh, and then also, especially if you're using a uh, service like Gmail or Yahoo, if that still exists at this point, I don't know. Um, but if you're using something like that and they give you an opportunity to mark things as spam and you get stuff that isn't, that is, is, that is spam, please mark it as spam because that helps them provide a better service. All right. uh, cookies. This is another way of authenticating who you are. If somebody can steal your cookies, they can steal your account, your session. So uh, again, you want those encrypted. We talked about encryption at the beginning of the, uh, of the, the talk. Um, so third-party cookies can also be used to track you across multiple sites. Uh, so uh, doubleclick.net is, is one of the more famous ones, but there's lots of other places that are tracking you everywhere you go and building up a profile about who you are. Uh, so be cautious of the cookies and be cautious of third-party uh, uh, accounts that are given access to authentication information for you or to your account. Uh, a, uh, for a good demo, which we're not going to do here, there's an add-on uh, add for Firefox called Lightstream. Uh, and, um, some of the sites are quite interesting to see how many different cookies and, and affiliates they're working with. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick on one that I actually like. Uh, for the most part, Newegg has done a lot of stuff fighting patent trolls, so I, I applaud them for that. Uh, they have a really crappy website, so I don't applaud them for that. Uh, one of the things that's really crappy about their website, aside from the fact you can't fight products, uh, is that uh, they have four million uh, affiliates. So uh, if you're going to bring up Lightroom for Newegg, make sure you're on a large monitor so you have room for all of the different cookies that you're going to find out about. And JavaScript, but anyway. Uh, and by the way, if you have cookies turned off uh, and you bring up Newegg, you just get Newegg. If you turn cookies on and bring up Newegg, then you get this huge graph of stuff. All right, uh, device ID. So phones have, and other mobile devices, have a specific hard-coded uh, ID that is often sent along with your request. Uh, also, Verizon adds a Verizon-specific unique identifier to every web request that you make, and you can't turn it off because they're sending it in place. Um, I don't know if you, can turn, if, if you can avoid it by using SSL, by using encrypted uh, uh, connections, but I believe that they've turned that on within Android, and you're just kind of screwed if you're using Verizon. But that's generally the case because they're, they're opposed to net neutrality and stuff like that. All right. Uh, security questions and answers. The most important thing for security questions and answers, truly the most important part of, of dealing with those with different institutions is to lie. Right? They don't need to know what your grandma's favorite mascot was. Right? 
They don't need to know her maiden name. They don't need to know her shoe size. They don't need to know her hair color. They don't need to know any of those personal th things about you. So when they ask you a question, give them random data. So sure, you could just answer elephant or something like that, but even better, random strings. Good place, though, to have those pronounceable strings because you might end up having to tell this, the, the, the passphrase to some, or the, the, the answer to somebody over the phone. Um, if you can, also make up the questions. And if you can make up the questions, make it a random string. Please, specifically in that case, do make it something pronounceable so that if the person that is making minimum wage helping you get into your account <laughs> needs to say it, make it something they can pronounce. Be nice to them. They're not making very much, and they are trying to help. If, you're, if you are actually having to use your security questions with somebody on the phone, you're the one in need, in need of assistance. So be nice to them so that they'll be nicer to you. All right, uh, multi-part authentication. So first, we'll talk about what, what are parts that you can have for authentication. There are three types of data. What, what do you know? What do you have? And what are you? So what do you know? Passwords, usernames, things like that. Uh, what do you have with you? It would be a token um, uh, and, and anything that you can carry with you. Uh, so your smartphone apps have tokens and so forth. Uh, and then what are you? Fingerprint, DNA, eye print, whatever else you got. You know, I don't think you can do ear prints at this point. Um, the problem with those is they're difficult to change. Sure, you can chop off part of your ear or all of your ear and change your ear print, um, but it's not really practical. Uh, in, in most cases. Uh, so I prefer to have things that I can revoke and that I can change. Uh, so that means things that I know and things that I can carry. So we'll talk about two-factor authentication using those two factors. Uh, there are basically two method, me methods for that. There's the application uh, or token type of, of device and there's also messaging SMS as it came up earlier uh, NIS or NIST or whatever the, the, the federal government at this point is saying uh, using messaging is not a secure mechanism for two-factor authentication, so you should not use that. Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree with them, which we will get to when we get to a couple slides. So two-factor uh, authentication with a token or an application. Uh, basically, the application inside your smartphone or smart device becomes your token. Uh, you don't need to give out your phone number. So if you're trying to buy uh, um, you know, stuffed toys at some random website, they don't need to know what your phone number is so that they can go through and spam you or, or give you phone calls. Uh, so why give that out? Uh, and most of the places, even my bank, they really don't need my phone number. They need a way of getting a hold of me the way I want them to get a hold of me, and calling me is not the way that I want them to get a hold of me. Uh, so the tokens are basically time-based uh, 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 tokens. They have random strings that were seeded inside of a, 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 a random uh, number generator, a random string generator. And you, you need to keep them in sync for time and that they will, so that on your device there will be a certain number and the, the website will be expecting that number during that uh, particular time frame. Uh, it does require you typing in in many cases. YubiKey and some other things are, are short circuiting that where you can push a button and it, and it authenticates for you. Um, but you can use your smartphone or uh, tablet or whatever at, like you would a, a hardware token. So messaging uses the phone number. They've got to have your phone number in order to message you. Uh, if you're using some kind of uh, third party uh, uh, messaging app, like Signal or something, they might not need your phone number, but they still need a way to get a hold of you. And I don't know of anybody that's using third party stuff like that. They're all using uh, plain SMS. Uh, like I said, my bank doesn't need to be able to call me. They need to be able to get a hold of me. They don't need to be able to call me. For people that don't have phones or can't use phones for some reason, by allowing banks to go through and require having your phone number, that becomes a problem because they now have lack of access to be able to do certain types of banking. Um, and also, I just find it rather annoying that anybody's calling me at 7 o'clock in the morning any day of the week, uh, much less on the weekends and so forth. Uh, if they want to get a hold of me, there's other ways for them to do that. Um, and as I say, if I'm going, going through and just buying stuffed animals or whatever online, they do not need my phone number. So I'm opposed to that. Uh, the other thing is that messaging becomes... Uh, fairly easy to take over to impersonate and basically do a man in the middle attack so it's actually not secure. So that's the other problem with it is that it's not really helping you that much. Now in the case of a lost phone or your device that you're using for two-factor authentication, uh, most of the services offer a way to have backup numbers so that you can store those somewhere else. If they don't offer a way to have backup numbers, you could probably find a better 
place to, do your, to, to use for your two-factor two authentication. Um, so you can keep some random numbers in your wallet. So anybody steals your wallet can now get into your account. Or you could put them in your password manager. And now you've got them secure inside, locked up inside of, of an encrypted file so that you know, they're encrypted like all of your other passphrases because that's essentially what they are. Uh, birth date. When you can, same thing as the security questions. Why? You know, some places need to know what your birth date is, and, and federal law kind of requires it, and you can't get around it too much. Um, but uh, lots of other places ask for your birth date. They really don't need to know. Uh, um, not too long ago, I got to use a free meal at a, at a restaurant during a month that was not my birthday month, because that's when they sent me the card. I'm like, all right, fine. You know? um, so uh, one problem nowadays, though, is that uh, a few years ago, they finally started using standard uh, libraries for doing uh, date checks. And February 31st doesn't work anymore. Uh, I had uh, uh, lots of different places up until about three or four years ago uh, have February 31st on an odd year as my birthday. Um, so, but it doesn't, that doesn't work anymore. Um, but I did figure out this command here for date that will give me a random string that's kind of between the 50s and the late 80s. So you can have a random uh, birth date uh, putting it into a human readable format. Uh, these slides will be available, and that, that particular command is also in my Linux Journal article, which will also be available uh, in the next uh, couple weeks. All right, other data that might be important, so uh, website password limitations. Uh, the talk, what we were talking about earlier with AMAX, where they won't allow you to use certain characters, put that in your notes, because some places don't tell you that they don't allow those characters. It just doesn't work. Um, or in the case, and, and Netflix did fix this, uh, Netflix would truncate after 10 characters. So I put in a 20 character uh, uh, passphrase and it didn't work. And at some point I figured out that if I just put the first 10 characters, I could log in. That was rather annoying. So I have notes in my Netflix account saying, don't do that. Uh, and as I say, I think they fixed it though. Capitalization can also be a problem. Uh, yes. For example, if you have uh, capital letters in the email address that you use for that particular website, my experience has been that if you try to log in but using not lowercase, you can log in. But if you logged in, and then when you get to your uh, password page, you can see that your your login is capitalized, but they don't accept uh, caps. Yeah. So one thing with that though, like not allowing special characters, that's an indication that they don't know what they're doing, and maybe you shouldn't be giving them personally identifying information. So if you've got a company that's like that, go buy from somebody else. Uh, there are lots of places that don't allow a plus in the email address. I actually have a very easy workaround about that. Mostly I just don't buy from them. So show me you can take security seriously or don't get my business. Pretty easy. And if a lot of us do that, then it'll start making a difference. Adding uh, random capitalizations to email is considered a, a low entropy additional, uh, an addition of low yeah. entropy to the well, and for, for email addresses, for the domain portion of the email address, capitalization is irrelevant by RFC, and the identifying portion, portion of the email address is irrelevant by tradition in that the RFC allows it to be different. Fred with a capital F and Fred with a lowercase f could be two different people, but I don't know of any place that's done that in 30 years because it would just be really confusing. But it's, uh, usually it's, it's maintained Observe a place and you can see the yeah. capitalization. Yeah. But whenever it comes to the backhaul and everything, it's all in lowercase. They, they should go through and take care of that on their, on their side. If they can't do that properly, again, it's really an indication that the people maintaining their infrastructure have some educational issues that they need to work on. Um, and that, I won't say that I've never worked at a place that had some of these problems, but I, I have tried to fix it. Uh, also, something I did not know um, uh, until a couple of years ago. But a lot of cases, we think of pins as being four-digit numbers. But a lot of cases, they can actually be five or six digits. Experiment with it, because you don't want, if it's like your, your uh, cash card, you don't want to set it to five digits and then find out all you did was lock yourself out. Um, so you want to experiment with that make sure that's OK. But if you can use five or six digits someplace, that'll be great, because everybody's concentrating on breaking four-digit characters, or four-digit strings. All right, so I mentioned key value store or being able to put your security information in. And this is how it looks in KeyPass 2x. 
Uh, so basically, under the second entry on the, on the left, which is really, really tiny, so I can't remember exactly what it says, um, you can go through and put in a, uh, you know, the identifier that you want, the key, and then you can also put the value for it. And you'll see that the value is, is shown in plain text. It's not hidden when you select the item. In most cases, if it's security questions and answers, they don't go through and hide them anyway, so you're not really exposing much. It just annoys me. I think I should be able to say, you know, don't, don't show that in plain text either. Um, but the key is, now I can keep it all in one entry, and it's a little easier. Uh, and they don't have a uh, keyboard shortcut to get to it, uh, but using the menus, you can say copy so that you can then paste it. Um, and I don't remember if they, if they automatically expire it. Um, so that would be a, a good thing for, the, you know, for, for an at-home exercise. And if they don't, submit a bug, because they should. All right. Um, backups. Make regular backups. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, this has got everything that you want, uh, all of your information. If you lose that file, if you lose access to that file, you've lost all of those passphrases. You can't get into websites anymore or whatever else that you've stored in there. Um, also remember, though, that as is, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, cloud is forever, or backups last forever until you want them. But you know, when you don't want them, they can be around. So if you've changed your passphrase on your, on your password manager, and there are still copies of the old file out there somewhere, then that old passphrase still works on the old copies. So if, you've, if somebody's gotten a hold of your password uh, manager passphrase, you also want to go through and get rid of the old copies once you've gone through and changed your password, because those are all exposing you. And if you've got copies up online on Google Drive or, or whatever else, then if somebody gets a hold of that data, they've got, the, again, they've got the old version that has the old passphrase on it. Um, when you do backups, we want to have offsite backup if you can. Uh, so that could be cloud account, but you could also be putting that on a thumb drive in a, th in a safe deposit box or sending it off to a relative's house or keeping an extra copy in the boot of your car or whatever. I don't know what you, where else you do things. Um, but it uh, depends on how many tornadoes you have, I guess, whether or not car and house are considered the same, same place, right? Um, so you want to keep a copy of it somewhere that, so that if your house or your computer gets compromised, lost, burns down, you have a copy of the file somewhere else. Um, and as I say, for, for clouds, uh, remember they do backup things automatically, so you can delete things on the cloud and pretend they're gone, but they're not necessarily gone from all the different copies that are out there. And if somebody breaks into the, the, the cloud provider, they might have access to all those backups, even if you don't. Uh, we are missed. A good backup service is TarSnap, if you want to look into that. It uh, does the encryption on your local machine so that nothing is in the cloud in the clear. OK, good. So you've got an encrypted file inside an encrypted file system, and you're backing up that, that so you get, you're yeah. doubly protected. So yeah. the code's open. The code's open. The code's open. So oh, it's, all, it's free software as well? So you can, you can uh, well, for BSD license is free software. Yep. BSD is free. like free run around naked software. Okay. All right. Well, we'll leave that portion for, again, exercise for home, not here. All right. Um, now, data escrow is another useful use for this. So I have a, a file that encrypts the data that requires a password to get in that is fairly secure. Like encrypting a, a spreadsheet is not encrypting a spreadsheet. It, there, it's easy to break. Two-year-old can figure it out in a couple minutes. But uh, a password manager is actually fairly secure. You're, you're securing the, 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 the file that's being, uh, that you're saving off. So you don't have to put just credentials in there. You can put any kind of information that you can store inside of that. Uh, so you could also have uh, a, a uh, and I recommend a second account or a second file uh, or multiple files as the case may be. So you can have all your credit card information and stuff that's easy to get to so somebody steal your wallet. Uh, your, if you've got a will, if you've got a you know, safety deposit box, all these other things that you have that aren't authentication but are useful information, especially if you want to be able to provide those to a third party should you become incapacitated or die or something like that. Um, and you can also add attachments. So if you have a will, you could actually take a PDF of the will and put it inside a KeyPass database and then save that off as an encrypted file and then give the passphrase or portions of the passphrase to people so they can get into that file should that uh, become necessary. Um, by also using different files, you're also limiting 
uh, um, damage should one of those files be compromised. So either because somebody's gotten a hold of your passphrase, or perhaps there was a subpoena about something you had to do, some consulting you were doing, and you don't want the, the, pass, the, the subpoena to your, your password database to then compromise all of your uh, will information or the secret Swiss bank accounts you have or whatever else that you might have uh, that you want to keep that keep those separate. All right. Uh, now going forward, I recommend change your passphrases on a regular basis. Use long random strings everywhere. Like, like I said, I want the password manager to be able to show me random strings or give me random strings at the e when I'm setting up an email address, when I'm setting up security questions and answers, any, you know, anywhere that I might just want to throw a random string in there, I want the password manager to make that easy for me to do. The ones I know of don't do that um, unless you bring up a different tool, you know, bring up another instance. But you know, by that time, I'm just using a different tool. It's same copy of, the, copy of the same tool, but it's essentially a different tool. Uh, use long random strings as much as possible, as long as possible. There's a lot of sites that do not allow 120 character strings for passphrases. Uh, I have run into that a lot. Um, so you just sometimes have to compromise. There are places that only allow 8 and 12 characters at this point because they still think it's the 70s. Um, and then also for email addresses, you can only make those so long to, to before they become unusable. And there are some length limitations for those as well. Uh, so putting using a, a 2,000 character random string in your email address just doesn't work. Uh, it'd be really freaking cool if you could, but it doesn't work. All right. Um, use sub addressing with your email addresses with those random tokens. Use multi-factor authentication. It's, I still don't think it's as great as, as a lot of people are trying to pretend it is, but it is still better than just passphrases, uh, especially for the really important stuff. And then the other thing, of course, is we, wanna, we want all this data to be encrypted so that third parties can't see it. One of the places where it isn't being encrypted is email. So remind your vendors that you want your all email coming to you to be encrypted. I don't necessarily mind that my bank is sending me information about what's going on in my account. I do mind that they send it in clear text, allowing other people to figure out what's going on. Hey, you just got $100,000 from Maldives. Well, I don't really want Russian hackers to go, now's the time to strike, right? So just say, you have an account update you might be interested in. That would be nice. Or better yet, encrypt the whole thing so that it's not readable until it gets to my, my system. All right? And if 300 million of us in this country ask for it, they might actually do it. Probably not, but you know we can try. Again, use unique email or, uh, credentials for every site. So unique, every part of the, every portion of the, the credential should be uni unique to that particular site. And, all right. Uh, some resources I put in here. You can go through and read those on your own. I have a link to uh, Matt Honan's uh, article for Wired. Uh, also, some other things. There's a link to where you'll be able to find information about my uh, uh, article that goes into more depth on several of the topics that I touched on tonight. Uh, some credits, the XKCD. If you don't read that, it's great stick figures. It's awesome. Uh, the domino image I pulled out of Open Clip Art. Uh, and then uh, some extra links. And all right. Any questions that we didn't get to already? Dennis. Uh, so you mentioned HTTPS everywhere from the EFF. Mm -hmm. They also have Privacy Badger will let you control uh, cookies, tr tracking cookies. Yep. So EFF has, done a, has created a couple of different pieces of software. They've done a lot of things for helping protect privacy and our liberty and, and basically saying it's your data and you should be able to track and you know keep keep control of it. Uh, I solved the cookie thing by just not allowing cookies. Um, but uh, you know except for select cookies a couple places, privacy badger is supposed to make that much easier. I just haven't looked into it. Yeah, it does. There's a little icon up on the, yeah. the, the, the bar there and you can see what's being tracked. You can turn them on, turn them off, so you can control that. Yeah. My thing is I just say no. And, and, that's all. and when I do allow them, I allow them for specific things. So that Newegg doesn't get to set cookies for 400 sites if I want to go buy something from Newegg. And that's uh, exactly what you do with privacy badgers. So. Cool. I'll have to look at it. All right. And, and is it, that's also available from the Mozilla uh, add-on repository. You can go to the FF site and just uh, install it from there. Yeah. But I, I don't like uh, recommending 
third party sites for something like that. For those of us who know what we're doing and know how to check it and stuff, it's not so bad. But for most people, uh, and that's why I, I didn't recommend HTTPS everywhere for a number of years, just because it wasn't in the, uh, the Mozilla site. But it is now, they're really easy to get to from within the web browser. And another question back here? Yes, sir. Uh, just a comment, uh, something that saved my bacon a few times. Um, in the notes section of KeePass, I keep a section that simply says old passwords. And that way, it saved my bacon because, mm -hmm. you know, oh, we had to restore system X from a backup that was three months old. What was the root password then? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, both KeePass X, 1X, and 2X versions both have a history. Uh, tool. It's done a little bit differently in both of them, but they're, they're both easy to find. So if you've changed an entry, then it's got a copy of the old version of that entry as well. And whether that be the passphrase that you've changed, or you've changed your notes, or you've changed your security questions, uh, they have those in, in place as well, So which is useful. And I find it useful at places that have single sign-on within the company, except for the place where they just copied and pasted this shadow file, and nobody knows that's what they're doing. Yes, Ed. Does KeePassX have a search capability so that you can search like the URLs yes. of your so keys? You, you can search a string and it will go through and look at things. I don't think it looks at the password portion of it. I hope not. But it does if you, it, so you can have search on, it, it, the search will find based on the entry name, URL, um, and probably not notes. Yeah, if you use this for uh, a good amount of time, you will get in the situation where um, I, I want to find the PayPal URL um, and I don't want to look through 400 lines of, I don't know how they sorted that to yeah. get to it. Yeah, and I, I have enough of them in there. I, don't, I, I have things I use once a year or once every two years, and I don't remember where it is in the tree. And so I just so go this, uh, searchability is really yeah. yeah, I use it. It does a pretty good search. Yeah. So I just used it with customer service the other day. They wanted my, my contract number for something, and, and I was like, it's an account I canceled, but they keep charging me for it. And I'm like, search, there it is. Oh, I do have the contract number. Now cancel the thing. All right. So uh, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs>